Good morning, everyone. We're uh, making our way through the Gospel of Matthew. So if you would turn there with me, please, in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5. We're on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 26. And uh, let me just review a little bit. Um, So this morning, Andrew read the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. And then uh, last Sunday, during the public scripture reading, we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 5, the the second giving of the law. So it was the Ten Commandments again, basically. And what we're going to see, beginning in verse 21 down through the end of chapter 5, is Jesus basically teaching the true meaning of the law, and specifically the Sixth Commandment. That's what we're going to be looking at today, the Seventh Commandment. Verses 27 through 32, and then um, the third commandment after that. And the idea is, as we heard from Jesus in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in keeping with that role of Christ with the law, Um, part of him establishing or fulfilling rather than abolishing the law is actually clarifying the true meaning of the law. And especially in the context of what was going on in Israel in those days some 2,000 years ago when there was a lot of um, overemphasis of certain parts and ignorance about other parts And so the the law of God in terms of its true meaning was twisted very much by the scribes and the Pharisees, and too often, therefore, the people were ignorant about the true meaning of the law. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, the true meaning of the law, and specifically the sixth commandment in verses 21 through 26. And before I read the passage... Uh, why is this important to us, ultimately? And this is our goal. This is what we're driving at. So here's a quote from J.C. Ryle in his expository thoughts on the gospel. He was an Anglican priest in the late 1800s, a very godly man. And uh, he wrote this, Ignorance of the real meaning of the law is one plain reason why so many do not value the gospel and content themselves with a little formal Christianity. They do not see the strictness and holiness of God's Ten Commandments. If they did, they would never rest until they were safe in Christ. So that's our goal. That's what we're driving at ultimately. So here's the text for today. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last uh, penny. So Jesus and the sixth commandment. The first thing we 
see here in this paragraph from Jesus is the, the letter of the law in verse 21. He begins by saying, You have heard that it was said to those of old. And we need to understand that Jesus nowhere contradicts the actual law found in the Old Testament scriptures. Je Jesus doesn't come along and say that God in his law said something. I have something else to say. I have something different to say. That's never what happens from the teaching of Jesus or his disciples. But notice carefully what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of old. If, if, he, if he meant to speak against the scriptures, the actual scriptures, he could have said that. You have heard that the scriptures said, but I say to you, and that's not what Jesus says. Instead, what Jesus is taking issue with is what the people were used to hearing from their teachers. And in this case, the scribes and the Pharisees. And what were the people used to hearing? The letter of the law. But they weren't used to hearing about the heart of the matter. They weren't used to hearing how the law penetrates the heart. The true meaning of the law of God. That's what the Pharisees, the scribes focused on. But that's not what Jesus focused on. Jesus focused on the, the heart, the true meaning of the law. And so that's what we hear him develop here. So he goes on. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And you recognize that, right? That's from the Ten Commandments. Do you remember which commandment that is? The sixth. The fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother. The sixth commandment says you shall not murder. We saw that in Exodus 20 and verse 13 this morning, last Sunday. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 17. The King James Version says you, you shall not kill. But murder is the correct interpretation. Because when you hear thou shalt not kill, it can leave you with the idea that, that all killing is wrong. And that's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that all killing is wrong. Some forms of killing people are not only not sinful, but they're, they're required. And uh, I'd like you to keep your finger here in Matthew 5 and look with me for a moment in Genesis chapter 9. And remember verse 6 in Genesis chapter 9. So this is interesting. This is uh, after the flood, but it's clearly before the giving of the Ten Commandments. So murder was a sin, you'll notice, before the giving of the law, but capital punishment was required by God before the giving of the civil law. So Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, God says through Noah, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. And why? For God made man in his own image. So the first part of verse 6 is capital punishment. This is a shall from God. Somebody sheds the blood of man, somebody commits murder. If somebody unlawfully, unjustifiably takes the life of another human being, then that person shall have his blood shed. 
And the reason is because of the Imago Dei, the, the image of God in man. That, at the end of the day, is why murder is so evil. Murder is evil because it's the destruction of the image of God in man. And therefore, once that has occurred, then the murderer must himself be put to death. If capital punishment is not upheld, then that actually implies a low view of the sanctity of human life. And that might si sound ironic to a lot of people. In fact, years ago, do you remember Larry King Live on CNN? I know that a lot of you now have never heard of Larry King, but uh, Larry King had this show on CNN for years. And one time he made the statement, uh, he said that I, I would take Christians more seriously when they speak against abortion if Christians would take a stand against capital punishment. And so Larry King assumed that Christians believe that all killing is wrong. All killing is in effect murder. And so if we stand up for abortion, but we don't stand up for capital punishment, somehow that's inconsistent. But according to the Bible, standing up for abortion and standing up for capital punishment are both examples of standing up for the image of God in man, the sanctity of life. They're not inconsistent. So this is required by the sixth commandment. Also, killing in the name of a just war is not forbidden by the sixth commandment. We're not going to trace that out, but in your own time, check out Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. God has entrusted the power of the sword to the civil magistrate to execute murderers, but also to engage in just war. So if you kill as a member of the military in the name of a just war, that's not murder. But the sixth commandment does condemn the unlawful taking of human life including abortion, by the way. And murderers must be held accountable, Genesis 9 and verse 6. And that's what Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 5, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And this probably is a reference to local courts in Old Testament Israel. And that was included in the civil law so, for example, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18, you shall appoint judges and officers and all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. So God had set up local courts and local jurisdictions in Old Testament Israel. And part of their job was to hold murderers accountable. But many of Jesus' hearers understood, not from Jesus, but from their traditional teachers, many of Jesus' hearers assumed that as long as they didn't actually murder anyone, as long as they weren't guilty of a crime that would have made them uh, liable to prosecution by the court, then they were good as far as the sixth commandment was concerned. And Jesus is going to say, not so fast. And that's what we see next. So Matthew chapter 5 and now verse 22. But I say to you, in contrast to what you have heard, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
So Jesus recognizes and emphasizes that the law of God doesn't just deal with outward performance and observable appearance. The law of God deals not just with externals, but it penetrates to the heart. And here, Jesus is being consistent with the law itself. Jesus is upholding the Old Testament law. Um, the Old Testament itself talks about the heart over 750 times. The, the Old Testament, as God gave it, was not just concerned with outward appearance. And here's just three samples for you from 750 plus Old Testament passages. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what the God of the Old Testament, who's the God of the New Testament, requires. And this is familiar, Psalm 119 and verse 11. Your word I have hidden where? In my heart, that I might not sin against you. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it the heart spring the issues of life. So, Jesus is upholding the authority and value and scope and extent of God's law rather than contradicting it. But again, think, look at his words. That everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So remember, Jesus is talking about the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Now, he's talking about anger. Murder begins with anger in the heart. Human judges, like God set up in Deuteronomy 16, like what we have in our society, Human judges can only hold someone accountable for the outward act of murder. But God sees the heart. And God holds us accountable for anger in our hearts. This doesn't mean, by the way, that anger in the heart and physical murder are just as bad. They're not equal. Jesus is not saying that. It means that God condemns both anger in the heart and the act of murder. And we see that very clearly in the biblical account of the very first murder in human history. So we were in Genesis chapter 9. Look in Genesis chapter 4. And we see here the pathology of murder. Genesis chapter 4. The first two human beings born in this earth turned out to be the parties in the first murder. So notice in verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their portions. That's supposed to teach us something, by the way. It's not that Cain's um, offering was inferior because it was of the fruit of the ground to Abel's. Cain's offering was inferior because it was 
it was any old fruit of the ground. Whereas Abel offered the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Abel offered the best from God's blessings. And Cain offered just anything. And that was a reflection of what was going on in their hearts. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And Cain felt that. The text doesn't tell us how he knew, how he felt that, but he did. So Cain was very angry. And his face fell. Do you see the pathology starting? The heart, anger, the face. Verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And then the rest of the story is going to continue, verses 8 and following, where Cain murders Abel. But I want you to see the pathology. It starts in the heart, expressed in the face, gives expression in the act of murder. But notice that when sin was already in Cain's heart so that God calls him out for his anger, notice what, what he says. Sin is crouching at the door. So there's still a distinction between anger and actually carrying out murder. It, it's, it's an advancement of sin. It starts with anger in the heart, no doubt. God sees anger in the heart, yes. We're all liable to the judgment of God because of anger in the heart, absolutely. But actually following through with the act of murder is further sin. It's an advancement of sin. That's why God warned Cain the way that he did. So that's helpful to keep that in mind. So back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes on to say that even our words can be murderous. So back to Matthew chapter 5. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So now Jesus is progressing from anger in the heart to the words of our mouths, to name-calling, basically. Uh, insults that we see there in verse 22, whoever insults his brother. In the original, it's the word raka, which means empty-headed one, fool, idiot. Today, we'd call someone stupid. Actually, call them the name, idiot, stupid. And you'll notice that once again, Jesus is saying that uh, when we call someone a name like that, we're liable to judgment. He's bringing up this idea of judgment again. In verse 21, this judgment was basically at the local level. Uh, in verse 22, he's talking about the Sanhedrin, the highest court of judgment in the land of Israel. And uh, eventually he's going to talk about hell. So Jesus has this progression of judgment at the local court level, judgment at the highest court level, 
And what do these courts of judgment point to? Judgment before God. Judgment before the judge of all of the earth. The one who sees and judges the thoughts and tents of our hearts, our secret sins. And notice that he says that you will be liable to the hell of fire at the end of verse 22. The word hell there is the word Gehenna. And it literally refers to the city dump outside of Jerusalem. And they basically burned their refuse and they burned their refuse um, in such a scope that there was a perpetual fire going on. There, there was always refuse to burn. And so no matter what time you went to Gehenna to drop off your refuse, you were always going to see a fire there. And so that... ...filled with people who never actually put another person to death. But they were still condemned by the sixth commandment because of anger in their hearts and their destructive words. So let me ask you, do you have unresolved anger in your heart? Do you murder people with your name calling? Jesus is trying to get your attention. Moving on to verses 23 through 24, we see there the priority of reconciliation. Let's read verses 23 through 24. So, Jesus continues, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So the picture there is the Jewish practice instituted by God of uh, giving offerings within the temple. And the picture is you go into the temple to offer your gift. And um, Jesus is saying, you go into the temple and offer your gift, that's a good thing. But when you're there and you realize, oh wow, there's this relationship issue I've got to take care of. My brother has something against me. Jesus says, leave your gift, go to your brother, resolve the issue, be reconciled. That's more important to God. The God of the Old Testament, again, same as the God of the New Testament, said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hosea 6 and verse 6. God is not impressed with uh, going through the motions of worship. He wasn't impressed with it then under the old covenant, and he's not impressed with it today. But this teaches us another facet of the reach of the sixth commandment. So we've already seen the sixth commandment extends well beyond the mere outward taking of human life to anger in the heart. But now we see that the sixth commandment also reaches to anything that breaks apart human relationships. We saw in Genesis 9 and verse 6, murderers, is evil because it destroys the image of God in another person. 
But here in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, we see that broken relationships are also destructive to the image of God because we're called as God's image bearers to reflect the unity within the Godhead. God has eternally existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before there were any image bearers, there was God in perfect communion, fellowship within the Godhead, within himself. The Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. And the Holy Spirit, as it were, was enveloping and even proceeding from that relationship of unity. Father, the, uh, God did not begin to love once he had creatures to love. God is love. And he's always loved within himself, within the Godhead. That is why humanity is a communal creature. That is why God created us, not to be alone, but to be a part of the human family, to be in fellowship, to be in community with other image bearers of God. And that is what murder destroys. But even if we don't commit murder, but we destroy human relationships we're still guilty of violating the sixth commandment. To the extent that we don't do our part to preserve and nurture human relationships, we violate the true meaning of the sixth commandment. And again, Jesus here is talking about sacrifices, gifts, and even though we're not under that Old Testament sacrificial system, this passage still applies to us. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, Peter instructs us, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Spiritual sacrifices. which means that this instruction to Jesus applies to us just as it did to his original hearers. God cares when we come to church. God cares when we use our gifts to serve him in church. God cares when we give our tithes and offerings in church. But God cares even more how we treat one another. And so before church is a great time to examine ourselves to see if we've offended someone with whom we need to seek reconciliation. When you're standing there in the morning in the bathroom, looking in the mirror, shaving, curling your hair, which I spend hours doing every day, <laughs> putting on your makeup, putting on your best, what a great time to pay attention and to ask God to search your heart to not just the outward appearance, but to the heart which God sees. God as I'm getting ready to go into your house and offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, how am I doing in my relationships? Have I offended someone? Does someone think I've offended to them? Uh, offended them? Maybe I just need to clear things up. Lord, show me. Lord, help me not to be a hypocrite who's just going to go through the motions of going to church while I'm undermining these relationships that, that depend on me. And I know what that feels like. Don't 
Don't ask Denise for examples because she'll probably talk to you till tomorrow morning. <laughs> but I do. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to um, have to come to church and then before the family gets out of the van, I have to, okay, guys, I'm really sorry. I, I sinned. I was harsh. I was impatient. Please forgive me. Or I've done this too. I spoke to your mother harshly. Please forgive me. I know what that's like. But that's, that should be woven into us. That should be part of our DNA as Christians. Well, what if we don't have time for reconciliation? We all have busy schedules after all. Life is really busy. Well, that's what Jesus touches on next in verses 25 and 26, the urgency of reconciliation. Let's read that. Come to terms quickly, Jesus continues, with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So now Jesus changes the focus of reconciliation from your brother in verse 24 to your accuser in verse 25. And the idea is if someone has a complaint against you, don't hold out for ultimate justice it may not go in your favor. You may not be as innocent as, as you've assumed. Maybe the, the issue that the controversy is about really isn't the issue. Maybe it was your tone of voice. Maybe it was the volume of your voice. Maybe it was your attitude. Instead, we should heed the words of the Apostle Paul. Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. If possible. Sometimes it's not. The, the Bible does talk about divisive people. Unreasonable people. Jesus was murdered by people who were mad at him, who had something against him. If possible, sometimes it's not possible, but whatever depends on us, the 1% maybe of the issue. But Jesus here in verses 25 and 26 emphasizes the urgency. So if we would uh, think of Paul's words in that light, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all and do it quickly. Or to put it another way that Paul does say, don't let the sun go down in your anger. The urgency of reconciliation. So that's the passage but before we close, I would like to think a little bit in light of verse 17 again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I'd like to think a little bit more about how Jesus fulfills the sixth commandment. We've already seen one way. We've heard it now. Jesus setting the record straight about the true meaning of the sixth commandment. But this is actually quite ironic and glorious. You shall not murder. How did Jesus fulfill that? Well, for one thing, he himself had a high view of the sanctity of human life so that he went around doing good 
healing people and feeding people and teaching them and being a blessing wherever he was and never saying something he shouldn't say. Never having unjustified anger in his heart. Jesus did have righteous indignation. I think that that's pretty impossible for us in theory. Righteous indignation is a thing. But at least in my experience, whenever we're angry, it's always mixed with sinfulness and pride and man-centeredness. So it's hard for me to relate. But Jesus displayed righteous indignation. The point is, Jesus in his life was a perfect example of upholding the sanctity of human life, of keeping the sixth commandment. But think about Jesus' death. Jesus was murdered. Jesus' death on the cross. It's true that he, uh, he um, submitted to it voluntarily. He laid down his life. He said, no one takes it from me. I, I lay it down of my own volition. It's true that that is what Jesus came into the world to accomplish. That was God's eternal plan he, because Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's true. But still, but still he was murdered. That's what Peter said to the, that crowd of Jews on the day of Pe Pentecost. You took by lawless hands and murdered, understood. Jesus was murdered. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Amen. Jesus was murdered himself so that we who are murderers at heart would be reconciled to God. Amazing twist of irony. Amazing stroke of providence. We're all condemned by the sixth commandment. We all deserve, like Jesus pointed out, the hell of fire. Jesus never murdered. He never sinned. He knew no sin. And yet he was murdered to save murderers like us. But even actual murderers like the Apostle Paul. Paul said on one occasion when he was speaking to a crowd of Jews and sharing his story I persecuted this way, Christianity. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. Saul of Tarsus, who was later to become the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus may not have literally personally grabbed hold of someone and choked them to death, or cut their head off, or ram them through with the sword, or what have you. But make no mistake about it, Paul had blood on his hands. He was responsible for the literal death of Christians because they were Christians. And yet, Jesus saved the likes of him. I wonder Paul would say, this saying is trustworthy and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even murderers, of whom I am chief. I am the foremost. And so Jesus fulfills the sixth commandment, the sixth commandment, excuse me, by succumbing to it. It's amazing. And then, 
Remember what we saw in Romans chapter 8 and verse, thir- verse 3. I'll read it for you real quick to refresh your memory. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. For what God, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So how does Jesus fulfill the sixth commandment? He transforms us from the inside out so that having peace with God now, being reconciled to God, we pursue peace with all people. He makes us who are murderers at heart, peacemakers. And being in fellowship with God because of the grace of Christ, we treasure fellowship with God's people. And it used to be before Christ, we didn't care. Somebody says something insulting to me, I'm going to insult them back, only worse. Somebody pokes me, I'm going to punch them. But now, because Jesus is in us, the Holy Spirit empowers us. Now we have tender consciences. And rather than respond like we used to, now we go the extra mile to pursue peace with all people. And when we do that, that's Jesus fulfilling the sixth commandment. If you don't know this Jesus, come to him today. And what he asks of you, what he asks from all sinners whom he saves, is not that you pretend to be something or someone you're not, or to put the best possible spin on your past. He asks us just to be honest. And just to humble ourselves before the Lord and just confess our sins and lay hold of Jesus by faith. And when we do that, his promise is we shall be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your holy law and how it reflects your holiness and your heart. And we thank you for the teaching and example of Jesus, but especially for his death and his resurrection. We thank you that Jesus has set us free from the condemnation of the sixth commandment. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.